Welcome back to Discovering Joy with Roy in the Beatitudes. I'm Roy, and today's Beatitude is the second one. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Just before the first service on a Sunday in our church in Arizona, one of the members called me aside. He had a story too good to keep to himself. A few days earlier, his wife was attempting to explain the death of his grandfather, her father, to their four-year-old son, Andrew. And she said, we can't see Grandpa Cookie now because he's died and gone to heaven to be with God. And now he's playing with the angels. When Andrew wasn't buying her story, he knew better. The angels play in California, he corrected her. Well, the second beatitude was pretty hard for me to buy for a long time, too. It made no sense. Mourning and blessing, they didn't belong together. But after being a minister for several years, I considered the alternative. Blessed are those who can't or don't mourn. No, the, the hard-hearted or the incapacitated are not blessed. They're deprived. My mother taught me this lesson, but she didn't know she had. For 17 years, she was a victim of Alzheimer's syndrome. First, there were the memory lapses, then the periodic moments of confusion, the fear of going any place new, the loss of the names of her nearest and dearest. Slowly, inexorably, she slipped deeper and deeper into the darkness until at last there was no calling her back. Her vital signs remained strong up to the end, but she outlived her mind by years. My mother couldn't mourn. Well, hers is an extreme example, but not a rare one. In her nursing home, just one of thousands like it, could be found dozens of men and women who had lost their ability to love, to talk, to laugh, and to mourn. Old age has ravaged them. And now, many years later, my younger brother has joined them. He no longer knows who I am. He can't talk. He can't mourn. Equally heartbreaking are the, the war ravaged. Nations mourn the loss of their young men and women on, on fields of battle. But on every battlefield, there are soldiers so war-weary who have lost so much that they've become numb to the carnage around them. And in America in 2020, we have seen evidence on, on the daily news reports of people who don't mourn the death of those killed by COVID-19, who, who don't mourn the death of those killed by racism, by those whose lives have been destroyed by poverty. An American poet, John Peel Bishop, once wrote, the most tragic thing about war is not that it made so many dead men, but that it destroyed the tragedy of death. In the many recent battles for our, in our country, to say nothing of the rest of the world, we've mourned what happens when life is cheapened, senses are dulled, and innocent people are victimized. There's something far worse than mourning. It's not being able to mourn. The gruesome fact is that the ability to mourn is not a universal human trait. I've just mentioned a few, but we could borrow the jargon of medicine and, and social science and, and add sociopaths and psychopaths and other disabled persons whose alienation from other human beings makes us wonder whether they do or can mourn. If not, we don't envy their immunity. Jesus got it right. Blessed are those who mourn. No stranger to mourning uh, was Jesus. And so he knew, his whole age knew, that mourning was a universal nearly universal thing, and, and his contemporaries talked a lot about it. Life expectancy in the first century was probably no longer than 
20 years or so. Now it rose significantly only in the 19th and 20th centuries when medical science scored breakthroughs in combating mass epidemics and in reducing infant mortality and, and in preventing deaths in childbirth. A, a baby born today can anticipate living to nearly 80 years of age. By the late, teen, eight, by the late 1800s, our, our forebears could expect an average of only about 34 years. To Jesus' first century audience then, deaths were frequent. And the spirit of resignation that, that permeates the book of Ecclesiastes resonated with their experience. Life was hard. Death came often. There's a time for everything and a season for every activity under sun, under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to uproot. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. Once again, uh, Luke quotes Jesus slightly differently from Matthew's quotation. He says, blessed are you who weep, for you will laugh. And again, he adds a warning that's missing in Matthew's version. He says, woe to you who laugh now, for you will mourn and weep. Luke's version captures the, the balance of Ecclesiastes. Jesus appears to be talking less about divine retribution in the coming judgment day than he is about the normal, observable flux of everyday life, with this maddening mix of, of good and bad news. Be patient, he comforts the bereaved. Your status will change for the better. And be warned, he admonishes the frivolous, your turn is coming. In Matthew, however, Jesus seems to be speaking of receiving comfort while mourning. To all who have lost loved ones, this is good news indeed. Now, we're not pining to dance again. We're grateful for much less, just, just a little comfort as we weep. We, we don't expect our sense of loss ever to have us or to leave us completely. In truth, we don't want it to. We could make it disappear, but, if, but only if we could forget about our loved ones. And that's a price we're unwilling to pay. We will return to our old routines, but we'll never be quite our old selves. From time to time, the memories will flood in and the tears will overflow. For us, the blessing must come even in our mourning as it quietly continues. We're not going to get over the loss of our beloved. We don't want to. A group of volunteers came every year to help out our rather needy college campus in California. Some cherished friends came. After a hard day of, pain, a day of, of painting and pounding and scrubbing, they, they rested most evenings by going out for their evening walk um, to get their exercise, I guess. Well, I went along one evening for fellowship. Uh, I hadn't been working with them, but I wanted to encourage them. One of them in the group, Barbara, and I soon separated ourselves from the others so we could talk. It had been almost a year since she and her husband had lost their 35-year-old son to a fatal illness, leaving behind his stunned wife and two-year-old child. And Barbara asked me, Will it ever get easier? She knew Joy and I had lost our adult son several years earlier. She was embarrassed that she still grieved so strongly after many months. But the pain wouldn't go away. Well, I could assure her, yes, it will get easier. But you'll never get over it entirely. You don't want to. You cherish the memories. And whether you invite them in or they arrive unbidden, their coming renews the longing, hurts the heart again. But you would not give up the remembering for anything. And in a sense, we invite the pain. I, I had read somewhere a doctor who, who considered the grieving extended more than a year was pathological. 
how wrong some experts can be. Like Barbara, people who have loved deeply will remember and cry, but they will carry on, grateful for the memories and the Lord's promised comfort, which, which they do receive, even in their mourning. We don't just mourn when a loved one dies. There are other times when mourning is real, like when a relationship dies. Take, take divorce as an example. Many friends who have experienced both divorce and death of a loved one is, insist that death was easier than divorce. Sometimes the grieving over divorce lasts for years. My parents were married 19 years, then both married someone else. And those marriages lasted longer than theirs to each other. Yet many times when dad and I were alone, he'd tell me again about his and mom's divorce and how if he had only done this or had tried that, maybe, maybe he could have held the marriage together. He never stopped grieving over what he perceived to be his failure. Where then does the comfort come in? Well, it comes, honestly, when you're ready for it. If you've been divorced, a counselor probably would outline something like the following steps for your recovery. First, face the facts. The marriage is over. You can't relive yesterday. Secondly, own up to your share of the responsibility. Casting all the blame on your former spouse only compounds your problem. If you give way to anger and bitterness, you'll warp your own personality and actually endanger your health. You, not your former spouse, are the loser then. Believe God's promise. Count on His grace. Your divorce is a disappointment, admittedly. But God isn't about to cast you out of His family. Let Him help. But don't expect God to do everything. You are now ready for a fresh start, one that builds on the lessons you've learned the hard way. Say goodbye to your days as critic and judge of others. You now have a new sympathy, a deeper understanding, a warmer heart. Don't rush into the arms of someone else. You've been damaged. You need time to heal and to gain insight into yourself. You don't want to make the same mistake again. Well, death and divorce are, are the obvious causes of mourning. Not so apparent, but still real and painful is the ending of any other close relationship. When a friendship is betrayed, or a trusted business partnership turns sour, or a permanent move to a faraway place separates dear ones, it's okay to weep, but not to despair. Now is time to give thanks for friendships that have proved true. Partnerships that can be trusted. Dear ones who have remained nearby and who, like you, could use a good friend. It's time to be reaching out. Mourning also comes when hope dies. My wife Joy and I have experienced the mourning that comes when hope dies several times over the years, actually. When, when Joy's mother died, for example, her father quickly moved on. After a 60-year marriage, he began to date again. People looking on who didn't know the circumstances were critical. How, how could he? He just buried his wife. Well, the outward appearance did seem a little disrespectful, but he received no hint of criticism from his family. Mrs. Whitney had been a victim of Alzheimer's, and never during those years did his dedication to her waver as he had to take care of everything. As I've heard Joy tell several people, including me, about her father, she said he did everything a good husband could do and should do for his wife. But then she was gone. He did, not, he did not deserve their criticism because, number one, his conscience was clear. And number two, 
He had mourned her death long before it happened. He knew it was coming. He was easing her way toward it. But when it became apparent that she couldn't get better, wouldn't recover, the hope that had sustained him died. He accepted the inevitable. And when, when hope starts to flicker, as it did for him several years before the end, that's when the mourning begins. Another aspect of mourning comes when love grieves for the lost. The New Testament speaks of grieving for those who show no repentance. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 12, 1, I'm afraid that when I come again, my God will humble me before you, and I will be grieved over many who have sinned earlier and have not repented of the impurity, sexual sin, and debauchery in which they have indulged. I think I said 2 Corinthians 12, 1, it's 12, 21. During the pandemic and the, the rioting during these days, I, I more than once thought of Jesus' heartbreak over the behavior of his people. Do you recognize these words from Matthew 23, 37? Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks up under her wings, and you are not willing. In both of these passages, you can, you can hear the heartache in the words. When you really care about somebody, and that somebody seems hell-bent on a course toward destruction, when you know the consequences, if they don't change their ways, and there doesn't seem to be any hope left that they'll repent, Mourning sets in. Mourning defined here as a sense of loss. Now, this is sounded pretty negative, I know. But in all these instances, it's good to be reminded that it isn't over until it's over. Rem remember the mourning that had already set in when Jesus died on the cross? Remember how his disciples were comforted then when Jesus appeared to them? His very presence, teaching them that with God, it isn't over until God says so. We do not hope in vain. Do you remember these wonderful words from Psalm 30, verse 5? Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. You see? Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. The promise is certain. You can... You can cast all your anxiety on Him because He cares for you, as 1 Peter 5, 7 reveals. Therefore, those who mourn will be comforted. Here's what this means. They will give thanks that they can mourn. They will welcome the embrace of those who want to love them through their loss. They will be able, when another's turn comes, to comfort as they have been comforted. They will be told their friends are praying for them and trust that they are. They will pray and know that they're heard. They will experience God's grace as only the admittedly undeserving can. Their hope will be renewed. They will laugh again. They will experience even as they mourn, joy. So I close with these enduring words from Psalm 30. Hear, O Lord, and have mercy upon me. Lord, be thou my helper. Thou hast turned for me in my mourning. Thou hast turned for me, I want to repeat that. Thou hast turned for me my mourning into dancing. Thou hast put off my sackcloth and girded me with gladness to the end that my glory may sing praise to thee and not be silent. O Lord my God, I will give thanks unto thee forever because after our morning there will be joy because Joy comes in the morning.
阿弥陀佛。